Good evening. I'm David Day, and you're watching Think Tech Global. And this evening's program is going to be all about Singapore. And to help us with this program, we are delighted to have uh, a representative of the U.S. Embassy in Singapore, uh, the Deputy, Deputy Senior Commercial Officer, and also a Hawaii boy, uh, Mr. Daryl Ching. And Daryl, nice to have you with us here in Hawaii, and welcome home. Thank you, David. It's a pleasure to be here. <laughs> it's great. It's great. So, um, uh, Daryl, explain to our, our, our audience here. I, I, I know that they're very interested to know that you, you went to Iolani and HPU, and we'll get that out of the way really quick. So we've got instant credibility here. But what is it that you, you got this big fancy title. What is it that you really do in Singapore? Okay. Uh, as part of the U.S. Embassy team, I do really three things. One is promote U.S. exports and help U.S. companies export to Singapore. Secondly is promote uh, U.S. business interests in the Asia-Pacific region. And third is to promote business investment to the U.S. Okay, so if I translate that for, for our audience, that essentially you're the marriage broker for American business in Southeast Asia. Correct. Something like that. We're, we're a bridge. Uh, our agency was founded uh, as a trade promoter, and, and we do that through a number of uh, different programs and services. All right, let's go to, uh, let me talk with our production team for a second here, and uh, let's show our, our audience map number one and hold it there for a moment if we could. And uh, um, for those of you who don't know who are watching this program, uh, uh, Daryl, give us a quick little geography lesson. Where is Singapore anyway? Singapore is in Southeast Asia, and uh, sometimes called the Little Red Dot, one degree north of the equator. So the weather we're having right now is, is very similar to, to what I see and, and experience in Singapore on a daily basis. All right, and let's go to a close-up of the tip of the Malay Peninsula there. That would be map number two. And here we see in, uh, in the light yellow uh, the, the island of Singapore, which is, how about let's compare that to the island of Oahu. Do you, do you know roughly? Uh, Singapore, roughly uh, 240 square miles, a uh, population of, of more than 5 million. So half to a third the size of the island of Oahu mm -hmm. with five times the population. Exactly. Wow. Okay. All right. Okay. And um, I, I'd like you to, to, to just just little bit of history for our audience now. I'm going to, um, uh, production team, let's see if we could pull up, uh, you know, the, the uh, founder of Singapore. Uh, that would be um, uh, visual number 12, if we could. Visual number 12. And um, uh, this will be a picture of Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, who has now stepped down and retired. But would you maybe explain to the audience what his role was? Uh, Lee Kuan Yew is the founding father of Singapore, and uh, he is really the reason why it has gone from a fishing village to, to what it is today. So uh, Mr. Lee is, is really the reason why uh, Singapore is where it is today, and they will be celebrating its uh, 50th year of independence uh, next year. All right, let's go now to your, your, your the, the marriage broker role, if you will. And um, sure. uh, I'm going to talk first about why... Why is uh, why is Singapore an attractive place to do business? And so why why is it it kind of a, known as a as a as a mecca, gateway mm -hmm. hub, whatever you want to call it, mm -hmm. for the whole uh, you know I think not only the Southeast Asia region but in some respects the broader Asia region. Uh, Singapore is is known to, to many people as the gateway to Southeast Asia. And uh, a lot of times, uh, different countries in the region will look to Singapore as a model, uh, what has been done there, what works well, uh, what maybe uh, can be improved further on. Uh, this could be anything from the water sector to the aerospace sector to the oil and gas sector, and I could go on and on. But re really, Singapore uh, is, is a model in a lot of ways uh, to, to the uh, 10 ASEAN countries. So we've got, in this region of the world, we've got a former British colony that broke off from uh, Malaya, Malaya. Mm -hmm. uh, what, early 60s, I think, something like that. Mm -hmm. and, and they have formed this incredible business platform uh, that cuts across, uh, not only from a business strength, uh, 
But I gather what you're saying is that Singapore is really a regional leader in terms of, of, of economics, yes? Yes. <clears throat> and political leadership in the region? Yes. It, it, it is a different model than, than some of the neighboring countries, but it's but it often looked at you know, in, in a lot of ways because what it has done in such a short amount of time, uh, a lot of times uh, you know, it is said that Singapore punches well above its weight. Uh, and, and for the U.S., uh, the U.S.-Singapore partnership uh, continues to, to grow and, and develop. Well, let's talk about that for a minute. So what is this partnership between the United States and Singapore? Uh, Singapore is our uh, 17th largest trading partner, our 13th largest wait, export wait, wait, wait. market. You're talking about an island that's half the size of Oahu is the 17th largest trading partner in the world. Now, that surpasses a number of countries in Europe, right? Exactly. And, 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 and also, I, I would note that, you know, the U.S. and Singapore signed a free trade agreement, uh, nine years, celebrating uh, ten years uh, this year. And that has been really the cornerstone and, and really uh, a mechanism for, for the trade to, to flourish. And, and Daryl, that, that free trade agreement that was, was, was executed between the United States and Singapore, that was... I believe the first free trade agreement between the United States and any Asian, any Asian country. Correct. Am I, is that right? That's correct. So, so the there is a unbelievable business tie between these two countries. A tremendous business tie. So, what's what is the free trade agreement like? It's kind of a general term. So, in in general terms, uh, it, it opened the market uh, in a lot of areas. Uh, one example is the banking sector. Uh, also, uh, for some of the uh, medical device companies, uh, also the transportation companies. Uh, with all of that, uh, there has been developments uh, on on U.S. products and services being able to flow more freely uh, to Singapore and throughout the region. So, if we shift from the the economic realm into the the uh, for a moment into into the security realm. In, 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 in the region, what kind of role does Singapore play in terms of, in terms of security in the, the Asia-Pacific region or ASEAN region? Singapore is a very strategic location within ASEAN because uh, a lot of the shipping lanes actually passes through ASEAN. Let's go back, uh, production team, to map number one so we can illustrate what uh, uh, Daryl is talking about here. Uh, and so the, the shipping lane that comes down uh, through the Straits of Malacca uh, there between the uh, Indonesian island of Sumatra, I believe. <laughs> I can't, my, my, my memory doesn't serve me correctly. And then uh, wraps around and then uh, Singapore and then heads back up through the South China Sea. Mm -hmm. well, well, ASEAN holds, uh, you know, geostrategic importance because, uh, you know, half of the global ship tonnage transits through the ASEAN sea lanes each year. And in Singapore, uh, itself, you know, a third of the world ship trade and half of the world's oil trade passes through. Huge. Huge. So, it's kind of like the old real estate thing we th we've heard in Hawaii here all the time. You know, location. It's location. <laughs> exactly. Location, right? All right. Well, let's, um, uh, let's talk a little bit about Singapore's relationship with its neighbors because I know a lot of business people you know, they, they see this little tiny island and it's surrounded by these giant countries, you know, uh -huh. like Indonesia and Malaysia. So let's talk about Malaysia first. What's the relationship uh, like between Singapore and its its former mother country, Malaya, now called Malaysia? What's their relationship? Uh, there, there's a lot of trade that happens between Singapore and Malaysia. Uh, the most recent project uh, that was announced is the high-speed rail that will take place between uh, Singapore and Malaysia. And the rail connecting, what, all the way to Kuala, Kuala Lumpur? Kuala Lumpur. Yeah, exactly. And so, who's building that? Uh, it, it would be a joint project between Singapore and Malaysia. They're, they're uh, talking about where uh, the stops will be. Okay, okay. Let's, let's, let's go over to Indonesia now, the, the, other, the other big uh, uh, big brother or sister on, the, on Singapore's border. What's the relationship like between Indonesia and, and uh, uh, Singapore? Singapore and, and Indonesia have, have a lot of uh, economic ties, and a lot of companies uh, do, do a lot of business back and forth. Some of the larger Indonesian companies have a presence in Singapore as well, so that continues to flourish. Uh, it will be interesting to see uh, what will happen now uh, with the newly elected regime in Indonesia and how that will help uh, kickstart things uh, back in Indonesia. 
What do you? What, let's talk about that for a moment. What, uh, you know, this new election of the new president uh, Jokowi mm -hmm. in Indonesia. How do you see that as impacting business or trade between the two countries? Do you, do you have any feel for that? Now? Actually, uh, fr from the trade side, uh, Singapore is an important gateway uh, for Southeast Asia, and Indonesia, with its large population, uh, will continue to be a, an important market, uh, not only for the U.S., but also for the region. Uh, in ASEAN, you know, there are over 600 million people, growing middle class, and we see that uh, as being a real opportunity for U.S. companies across sectors. You know, Daryl, we don't have time to, to hit every single other country and their in the region, their relationship with Singapore, but but uh, let's t let's talk about two other big ones for a second. Here. Sure. Um, let's talk about what's happened between between China and and Singapore business trade wise. What's that picture look like? China and Singapore uh, relations go back a long way, and there have been a, there have been a, a few government to government projects that are quite well known. Uh, the first one back in the in the 90s, uh, which was the Suzhou Industrial Park. That was followed by the Tianjin uh, Eco City, and then now they're talking about the third uh, Singapore-China uh, project. And uh, from what what I understand, uh, three cities are in the running, and uh, it will really depend on you know which city makes the most sense uh, for both uh, countries. And India, rising power. What's I, I I know from 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 doing business in Singapore that Singapore has a. a an important and a significant Indian population there. What's the trade business tie between India and Singapore? Actually, I, I'm not well versed in, in that area, but I do know that, that the Indian population has been doing a lot more, uh, you know, with Singapore and, and, and with India. A lot of the U.S. companies that are located in Singapore, you know, totaling uh, some 3,500, uh, many of them also cover that market from Singapore as well. Okay, so the picture that, that you've painted right before we go to a commercial break here is we've got this little island, and they got a lot of people, very little land, but they've got these uh, amazing trade re relationships with the United States, the bordering countries, the big players, China and India. And so does that make Singapore something of a, a place that, that you go to set up to then get into the region? Actually, Singapore is is now in a lot of sectors, uh, you know, developing itself as the world leader. So I gave the example earlier about the water sector. That is one sector that Singapore uh, has become a world leader. It now has its own homegrown company called Hyflux that, that is involved with the desalinization uh, side of water. And originally, Singapore uh, was doing it primarily for survival. And now it has gone to sustainability. And now it, it has become a world leader, not only in, in the water reuse side of it, but developing uh, technologies uh, that will benefit, you know, the world. So if I have a company that, that, that wants to get into some of the other Asian countries, Vietnam, Myanmar, Indonesia, uh, is, is, does Singapore make, make sense as a place to start? Uh, Singapore is a great place to, to actually have a sounding board, but I, I wouldn't necessarily limit it and say, you have to start in Singapore to get to some of these neighboring countries. A lot of times, uh, the ASEAN countries will look to Singapore and what's happening in Singapore as a model and, and, and study that. We're going to take a break now. And ladies and gentlemen, when we come back after the break, uh, we're going to talk uh, further with uh, Daryl Cheng about some of the interesting shifts in business that have been taking in, have been taken, uh, in Singapore and some some of the challenges to operating in that country, as well as some more of the advantages. So stay with us. We'll see you on the other side of the break. Hi, I'm Donna Blanchard. I'm the host of Center Stage here on the Think Tech Digital Series. The show is every Wednesday from 2 o'clock to 3 o'clock, and I want you to watch this show because I think that when we talk with artists on the show about what they do, how they do it, and most importantly, why they do it, I believe that it resonates within each of us and we find something inside of ourselves that brings us closer to all of humanity. That's what arts are there to do and that's what I'm here to do on this show. That's Center Stage. It's on every Wednesday from 2 to 3 o'clock. I hope to see you there. We're back. You're watching Think Tech Global and this evening's program is all about Singapore and we've got with us uh, 
uh, Mr. Daryl Ching, uh, the Deputy Senior Commercial Officer from the U.S. Embassy in Singapore with us here. And uh, if you just joined this program, uh, Daryl was talking about the trade relationships and the expertise that Singapore has developed in a number of different sectors. And, um, you know, let's talk a little bit before we get into to some more of the why Singapore. Daryl, let, let's talk about the some of the, in your experience, some of the challenges that the American business people have in, in getting set up and getting underway in Singapore. Let's let's handle those or talk about those now. You know? okay. And so, um, maybe maybe a place to start is 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 on the the cost side of things. Okay. So, what's your view? Of this too expensive for a little business now? Actually, I'll start off with a positive first. So, so Singapore is one of the easiest places to set up a business. Okay, all right. And and then taking it a step further, uh, because Singapore. Well, why is it? Why is it so easy? Because the government actually has, uh, you know, such a great structure put in place that a, a business could just go online and and you know register and be basically up and running very quickly. Okay. okay. Uh, now going to the, to the part about doing business. Uh, Singapore is a, an easy and, and a great place to do business. However, uh, most recently, uh, there's a lot more competition there for U.S. companies. So when we talk about competition, we talk about pricing. Okay. okay. So stiff price competition, margins are not as big as they used to be, but the U.S. companies are still very well known for its quality and innovation. And the competition in Singapore, why, why is it so intense? Uh, because Singapore is such an open market that many countries can, can, can bring in their products and services very easily. So when we talk about China, for example, U.S. companies, when we talk about machinery or parts and other things, uh, you know, they're facing some, some stiff competition on the pricing side. What's the situation in Singapore? Um, and I want to ask you about the labor challenge, mm -hmm. finding good employees. Um, but I guess before we get to employees, we better we better talk about finding the right people to do business with. And um, do you have an American company that's that's thinking about relocating or, or, or getting involved in the market in Singapore for whatever reason? Um, what's what's your advice on how's the how is the best way to go and find the right partner? Uh, the best way I, w I would say is do your due diligence, do it twice, do it three times. And contact us. A lot of times we can help U.S. companies uh, navigate the market, and a lot of times we're able to, to help them find one of the best partners uh, to work with. Oh, and how do you do that? We, we do that through, through our team uh, at the U.S. Embassy in Singapore. A lot of our colleagues have been around for 10, 20 years and know the players, uh, they're in, and they're able to, to contact the players and, and be able to determine if this person or, or this company is a good fit. Okay, so we, 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 we found whatever it is, a joint venture partner or, or uh, you know, a local manager or whatever is needed through the assistance of your office. We use the, the um, high-speed uh, internet setup. We got our company set up. Uh, uh, and is, are, 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 there, are there challenges in locating office space or, or warehouse space or, you know, what are the residency requirements for a company to, to get underway? Uh, in Singapore, most recently, there have been some, you know, increased business costs and also a tightening of the labor market. But, but in general, a lot of the resources, a lot of the supply, a lot of the tools are there for a U.S. company to succeed. Uh, I, I would say, uh, you know, the important thing is to, is to make sure that you are uh, looking not only to Singapore, but also beyond Singapore, to ASEAN the 600 million people, and, and, and that is, is the play for, for, for Singapore, is the gateway to Southeast Asia. And connections between Singapore and these other companies by, by, uh, by air is what? All, all, all within a, a few hours of, of radius. Uh, also, Singapore uh, has a very developed aerospace industry. Uh, it is now uh, building out its new budget terminal, and, and transportation, uh, you know, will, will be a lot easier and, and a lot more fluid uh, throughout Singapore uh, and the region. 
Is this you? You talked about uh, about this the labor situation tightening up, and uh, <clears throat> how does that tie in with the the? And, and let me ask you to talk a little bit about the the overall demographic challenge that Singapore is dealing with. What's the relationship between us, or what is what is the the demographic challenge that Singapore is facing? Uh, when, when I refer to tightening of the labor market, uh, you know, of the five million people, about a third are, uh, you know, expats and, and foreign laborers. So, so Singapore is contending with, you know, public sentiment and, and being able to, you know, have jobs for for its citizens. But but on the, on the business side, uh, being able to make sure that companies that set up in Singapore, any international company, has resources and the workforce uh, to be able to, you know, to be successful. So does that mean, you know, if, if I am uh, an entrepreneur, I've got a small company, I'm setting up in Singapore, I'm, I'm trying to find uh, people to, to, to work with me, that, you know, I have, <laughs> I have a 70% chance of, of hiring a Singaporean and a 30% chance of hiring somebody who's not from, an immigrant, somebody not from Singapore. Mm -hmm. Is that about right? Yeah, uh, Sing Singapore has uh, a multicultural, uh, you know, population, but but also a very educated workforce. Uh, a lot of the U.S. companies have set up manufacturing, uh, but also a lot of the service uh, sector. Is there a perception, Daryl? Do you think that that this enormous immigrant, I mean, a third of the workforce being uh, non-Singaporean, is huge? And do you think there's a perception out there that that this has resulted in a, a lowering of the quality of the, of the Singapore workforce? Uh, I, I wouldn't go so far as to say that. What I would say is uh, Singapore has great expertise uh, on the engineering side uh, and, and, and some of the other areas. Uh, what, what the U.S. Uh, can supplement that with is uh, some of the expertise that we have in, in the high-tech side, uh, on the innovation side, uh, those sort of areas. Uh. You know, a lot of a lot of business people are aware of the uh, over the, the kind of the trend over the last couple decades uh, in in Singapore in the efforts by that country and its financial sector to uh, provide for confidentiality of financial transactions, of bank accounts, and so forth. To the extent that you know, it's now often talked about that, that Singapore is kind of the new Switzerland. You've heard of that, I'm sure. I've heard of that, and and so that there's no misperception of that. Uh, let's talk for a moment about the the impact of that perception. You know, I'm an American business person, and I, I hear that Swi that Singapore is the new Switzerland. And uh, how does that perception, or or is it a reality? Is it? I, I would say a couple of things. One is uh, Singapore attracts a lot of uh, companies and individuals because it's favorable tax rates. Uh, on, on the U.S. side, uh, I, I would say that you know our, our colleagues in the Treasury Department and, and our teammate at the U.S. Embassy uh, in Singapore uh, are following that very closely. Also working with the American Chamber of Commerce on trying to make sure that you know the, the playing field is is level for, for U.S. companies. Well, I guess what I'm really getting at here is this. Uh, if I buy into that perception that Singapore is a secret confidential place to park money, uh, uh, and I am an American citizen or an American resident, uh, given this relatively new uh, FATCA law that was passed, mm. um, am I... Am I, am, am I operating with a misperception as to my own company's uh, secrecy of its bank accounts? In other words, under this new FATCA law, mm -hmm. is does Singapore playing along with the U.S. government? I, I, I would say yes, in general. Uh, Singapore is uh, a partner uh, of the U.S., and uh, it you know it realizes that it needs to also uh, you know. Be, be a place where U.S. companies and U.S. institutions uh, feel confident in, in what they're doing there. And uh, like I mentioned, our, our, our Treasury colleagues and our American Chamber of Commerce have, have been following this very closely. So, ladies and gentlemen, if you're listening to what he's saying, what he's really saying is just because 
uh, Singapore has a perception of being like Switzerland. Uh, don't step into the uh, don't step into the bucket naively and think that the uh, foreign bank account re reporting requirements of the Singapore banking institutions will not apply to you because they will if you're an American citizen or resident. And, and and the same thing for the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. Absolutely. A lot of times, you know, the U.S. now is is perceived as the gold standard. You know, where in the past, you know, we we sometimes looked at it as you know uh, an impediment, but now you know. The talk is that you know now it is really the gold standard. And you know, in, in talking about the gold standard in terms of corruption, um, uh, do you happen to know where Singapore ranks in terms of the perception of corruption? Uh, we just issued uh, our updated country commercial guide, and in that we we state uh, virtually no corruption. Uh, and and also I would. Uh, reference that the uh, American Chamber of Commerce and the U.S. Chamber re released uh, an ASEAN Business Outlook report, and that spoke about corruption uh, remaining to be uh, an issue uh, throughout ASEAN, except in Singapore and Brunei. You know, I have, I have, um, in my career, I, I have had a lot of dealings with attempted corruption, uh, especially in Asia, and what I've noticed. Uh, Daryl, over the years, is that consistently Singapore has been rated as a cleaner place to do business than the United States. True. Sing Singap well, I, I would say Singapore prides itself. It prides itself. Yeah. On 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 that, and uh, that that is why uh, you know it is it is and continues to be a gateway to Southeast Asia. What about this whole topic of business intelligence? Um, it, it seems to me that that you know that the, the, the government of Singapore is on it, meaning that you know they they seem to to know what deals uh, are not going to make it, uh, which deals are going to go through, and uh, you know I I wonder uh, uh, do you have any have you had complaints? From business people, that the government of Singapore is is somehow very intrusive into their personal affairs or their their uh, their business affairs, and is is obtaining business information or business intelligence. I personally have not heard that, but I do know that there are a number of Singapore agencies that are very much in tune with what's happening not only in Singapore, but throughout the world, and and they are at the forefront of of different industries. So some of their uh, government entities do pick and, and you know, focus on, on different industries for, for companies physically located in Singapore, but also helping the Singapore companies uh, expand overseas. You know, I think the audience uh, can appreciate, you know, a expertise or developing a, a kind of a cutting edge in aerospace. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things you mentioned earlier in the program that I thought is very fascinating is that Singapore's whole focus on water. And um, why is that? Uh, it, it all started with survival. So they needed to, to make sure that they had enough water for their population, enough water for their businesses. Then it went to sustainability and to, to diversify their water portfolio. Uh, they went into certain areas. Desalinization is one. Also, reuse and recycling. They catch every drop and they recycle and reuse water a couple of times. I noticed that the, in Singapore that the, <laughs> that the drainage system looks like it's been designed by Apple Computer, and which is exactly the point that you're making, is that you're right, is that it runs off the roof and they catch every little drop. And, 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 but why are they, I mean, doesn't Singapore have any natural springs or wells? Uh, they have uh, reservoirs. They don't, they, they don't actually ha have, have these other uh, things. So they that, either got to pipe it in or catch it. And, and, and some of it is, is piped in from Malaysia. I would add that uh, U.S. expertise has helped them develop. So Orange County was awarded the Lee Kuan Yew Water Prize at the Singapore International Water Week. And, you know, we can say uh, from the U.S. that we were part of, uh, what, of that I mean, success. What, what, what did Orange County contribute to the technology? I'm curious. Uh, some of that was their expertise and, and how they marketed it and, and what they did in, in Orange County. Well, we're going to take a break, and we're going to come back with some more fascinating uh, tips and advice from Mr. Daryl Ching from the U.S. Embassy in Singapore. We'll be back right after the break. Stay with us.
Hi, I'm Jay Fidel. That's Ted Ralston. You know, Ted is the uh, host of uh, Where the Road Leads. It shows uh, every Friday from 4 to 5 p.m. It's about technology. It's about how people collaborate and, and solve problems with modern technology. It's where the road leads. We all know that. We should all be listening. Join us there, 4 to 5 p.m. every Friday. Now, what about that do you agree with? All of it. I knew he'd say that. Aloha. Say aloha. Aloha. Good. We're back. We are live. And we're here. It's Think Tech Global. I'm David Day. And our special guest, uh, all the way from, I don't know what it's, Hawaii, Kai, or Singapore. And this is uh, Mr. Daryl Ching from the U.S. Embassy in Singapore. And we've been having a, a firecracker of a discussion about, about not only about business in Singapore, but, but issues of importance to the business community uh, looking at Singapore. And I guess, um, you know, in the earlier part of this program, Daryl, you mentioned that Singapore has really evolved, uh, and, I, and I, I guess it's, it's part of a strategic plan to be a, uh, a gateway, a hub, for finances, for for business, and in a lot of ways for the economics of the ASEAN region, if not into Asia. And so you mentioned that she hits way above her weight in terms Correct. of in terms of business firepower. Uh, and I want to, I want to remind the audience, in case you just joined us, that um, and I'd like you to repeat it. Compare Singapore to the island of Oahu one more time, Daryl, because I, I, you got to get this. You got to get this. Singapore, roughly 240 square miles, population of 5 million, and it's our 13th largest export market and our 17th largest trading partner. And it's one third the size of the island of Oahu. Yes. It's incredible. It's an incredibly interesting country, uh, uh, multicultural to the max very similar to Hawaii, um, uh, but plays, you know, a, a, a very unique role. I mean, it can be said in a lot of ways that, that, that Hawaii, in terms of foreign policy, in terms of national security, uh, it, it plays a very pivotal role in the Asia-Pacific region, and in, in, in some respects, Singapore has in the past as well. Um, and, and so let's do a little bit of a, a shift into the area of geopolitics a little bit. And um, uh, and let me preface this by saying, Daryl, you know, this this is an important for business people because you know they're not always um, with the tunnel vision of focusing just on business. They got to kind of look around and see what kind of what the big picture is. And what we've seen in in, uh, in uh, recent times is that we have the, the the rise of China. And so what you've said is that that Singapore has been closely tied in with China, they've built these industrial parks, and then there's a third one that's that's in the planning stage. Right? Yes. And so where is that one going to come online? Do you have any feel for that? Uh, I'm not sure about the timing, but uh, from what I understand, three cities are in the running. Uh, Chengdu, Chongqing, Xi'an. So this would be another major industrial park? A, a, it would be a government-to-government -government project between uh, Singapore and China. Okay. And so, the audience, you know about the rise of China. And so, what do we do now? Let's focus on India. And we have the rise of India, and, and certainly a significant connection between India and Indian nationals and the Singapore, Indian Singaporeans. Mm -hmm. I haven't said that very often, <laughs> so, uh, in Singapore. Uh, and so, India has recently uh, executed a series of seven agreements with Vietnam relating to business development, uh, a joint oil exploration, and a defense agreement. And so you have uh, two countries that border China, Vietnam and India, uh, working out uh, some business ties together. and. Uh, when I, when I was first thinking about this, uh, I'm wondering if the, the long-term trend of geopolitics in the region is to, to uh, kind of follow the air carrier's model in that, you know, most of our air carriers operate from hubs. Singapore has or is been, has, has been a hub. 
for business and, and in a lot of other ways, leadership and other things, uh, other areas. And I'm wondering, are you seeing Singapore's role as a, as a, as a mediator, as a leader in the region, is it being diminished by uh, the rise of these two great powers in the, in the region? I personally wouldn't say that. What I would say is, you know, China's rise and India's rise is good for, for Singapore, it's good for the U.S., and it's good for the world. I, I would say, you know... You don't that. think Singapore's going to get cut out of the, of the uh, mediator role, of the, of the gateway role in the future? Uh, Singapore continues to, to develop and, and, you know, what, one example is, you know, they have, you know, Maxwell Chambers there on the legal side, you know, with water resources, you know, they're a world leader and will continue to develop that out. Aerospace as well, I could go on and on in, in, in those sectors. Uh, and, and then with ASEAN strengthening its focus, you know, as the place and, and sometimes, you know, it's talked about, you know, the gravitational pull of China, you know. ASEAN, you know, is on the map and, and people and businesses will continue to pay attention to it because of its sheer uh, size and importance, uh, not only with, with its shipping lanes, but right, also, right. you know, some of the other things that I outlined earlier. What is the, the this, this uh, gravitational pull that you're talking about? And we've got this, I think the number that you used was 600 million, a market of 600 million within two, three hours flying time from Singapore, mm -hmm. roughly, in, in that area. Um, the other nations in that remote area, uh, not remote, in, in, that, in that 600 million radius, if you will, uh, how do they view Singapore? Uh, a lot of times Singapore is looked at as the model because it is done so well in, in a lot of ways. But also, on, on the flip side, a lot of times, uh, companies will have to make sure that, you know, even though it worked in Singapore, they need to, to temper that and, and make sure that, you know, some of these other countries uh, in the ASEAN region uh, are the place for a company, for a service, uh, and, and that's also important to, to consider. Okay, let's take an example of that. Let's say that, that uh, I'm an American business executive and I set up in Singapore, and, um, uh, and I, I have a product or a service that that's, seems to be working well in the, in the Singapore market. Uh, and so my eye goes to Ho Chi Minh City in Vietnam. What are you saying about the relationship between those two countries and those two markets? Uh, Singapore is also looking at, at where the companies uh, that are physically you know, headquartered in Singapore are able to, to, to take it further. So Singapore uh, is also helping you know, these companies look to markets like Vietnam, like Indonesia, like Malaysia, and you know their agencies are helping these companies uh, do that. Well, are, are you are you suggesting that my company located in Singapore, once I'm established there, I'm a foreign company now, is the Singapore government going to be helping me to get into the market in Ho Chi Minh City? If 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 a company from the U.S. sets up a, a presence in Singapore, there are a number of of uh, mechanisms that, that can help that company. Uh, Singapore government actually takes missions uh, to neighboring ASEAN countries. And they don't care whether the company is a Singapore national owned and founded versus foreign owned and founded. Is that correct? Uh, they have a number of, of programs. I'm not really talking about you know financial support per okay, se, okay. but I'm talking about you know expertise, expertise, you know, and, and basically you know, the Singapore brand is, is very well known in, in China, for example. And uh, a lot of times, you know, what, what happens in Singapore, if that is taken outside to an ASEAN country, that, that is also good for Singapore. I guess I'm seeing a, a, a twofer here. And, and that is that if I get set up in Singapore, I get the support of the Singapore government to move out into the region. And I also get the support of your office. So that's a twofer, right? Yes, and, and we are also very much active with, you know, two of our uh, partner agencies. Uh, well, not really, two, two of our partners, uh, one being the American Chamber of Commerce and the other being the U.S. ASEAN Business Council. Th those entities actually help the U.S. companies, uh, you know, in, in the region as well. You know, Daryl, let's do this. We're, we're coming down the home stretch of this program, and I'd like you to talk for a minute to the audience about, you know, Based on your experience helping American business 
get into Singapore or Singaporean companies exporting into the U.S. And, and I, know, I know they've had experience in other Asian countries in Taiwan and China, but, but let's focus on Singapore now. What are the, the, the key business tips or advice that you would give a, 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 a company looking to, to, to get underway in Singapore, whether they're, whether they're, they're selling products or services? What, what advice would you give? Uh, I, I would say, you know, look to Singapore. Uh, it punches well above its weight, but also look at the 10 ASEAN countries as a whole as well. And, and that will give you uh, the momentum to use Singapore as the gateway to ASEAN. And uh, the biggest challenges that you see American companies facing coming into the, the Singapore market? Uh, I, I mentioned a, a little bit about you know tough competition, uh, pricing, uh, but on the other hand, you know U.S. companies continue to be well respected for for its expertise, high quality, and innovation. Last topic, um, you know, and and and, uh, and I get to raise this topic because I'm a lawyer. Okay, uh, disputes, problems, intellectual property problems, uh, uh, arbitrations, mediations. Where does Singapore fit in the in the great? Uh, a judicial puzzle in terms of assisting businesses resolving problems. Uh, I mentioned Maxwell Chambers, and uh, right, right. from from what I understand, they have been able to receive and enforce judgments uh, in as far as China. So Singapore, it does so very well in being an international hub in a lot of the sectors. I think on the legal side, it will continue to play a very important role. So what you're saying is that you know you have a dispute with a company in China. Uh, intellectual property, whatever, and if that dispute is subject to arbitration in Singapore at uh, Maxwell Chambers or, or mm. one of the other uh, dispute resolution mm. operations in Singapore, that Singapore has developed sufficient firepower to be able to enforce the decision even in China. And, and I think it also goes to the fact that, that Singapore uh, is world respected, world respected and, and also has uh, you know the expertise and is sometimes known as the neutron level playing field I guess that's all part of the the uh, the design or the strategy that was established way back when of, of you know this little island country becoming kind of the the Asia's neutri neutral Switzerland kind of kind of mm -hmm. picture well we are about out of time here Daryl and uh, a any last thoughts or comments before we have to sign off? No, thank you for having me. It was a real pleasure to be here, and I look forward to, to hearing about more U.S. companies uh, coming out to Singapore and ASEAN. I'm sure there will be. Ladies and gentlemen, you've been watching Think Tech Global. I'm David Day, and our topic uh, uh, here uh, this evening has been Singapore, business nightmare, or Mecca. I think we come out on the Mecca side uh, pretty clearly. Um, and our special guest, uh, Mr. Daryl Ching, from the U.S. Embassy in Singapore. Thank you so much, and we hope to have you back here in Hawaii. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Good night. Have a safe drive home.